Good morning. For Sunday morning, March the 6th, we're continuing our Easter series that we've entitled From Gethsemane to the Cross. Last week, we talked about Jesus in the garden and and the prayers, and we talked about the, the word Gethsemane, meaning an oil press, and that's where they would take the olives and they would press them to get the oil. And we contrasted that to Jesus' prayer as he was so pressed that great drops of blood uh, came out during his prayer. I want to challenge you this morning to think with me about Jesus' arrest. When I, uh, my son was real little, we were at the post office near my parents' house, and we'd gone in to mail something, and as we came out, uh, the Cincinnati Police Department had a car blocked in and had a man in handcuffs. And he was not very happy, and I thought, wow, he's getting arrested, and one of the officers had a weapon drawn, and it was pretty overwhelming to think. And then my second thought, which is just a matter of seconds, I went from, wow, cool, this guy's getting arrested, to, oh, no, my son is here. I'm carrying him in a car seat, and and my car is past this scene where the officer's got his weapon drawn. And I thought, well, I'll just go back in the post office. And about the time that I apparently stopped what I was doing and turned, so a matter of just split seconds, the non-weapon drawn officer who didn't have the man in handcuffs, who was kind of observing everything, went, a buddy, you need to get to your car? And I said, yeah, I'm the white one just past where you're at. He goes, oh, so the officer with the drawn weapon holstered his weapon, walked over towards where the man in handcuffs was, and I carried Christopher and put him in the car seat base and uh, calmly and quickly got out of that parking lot. I've seen hundreds of arrests on television. I've seen just a couple in person. I also remember that uh, when Pete Rose was convicted of tax issues, he surrendered himself two days early to the penitentiary so as not to make a big deal out of it. Didn't want fanfare, you know, all the bad press. But no one wants to be arrested. And certainly not in the first century. But Jesus is in complete control of the environment. And let's look at his arrest. Now in Matthew 26, we, we can pick up right where we left off at the, at the end of the prayers in Gethsemane. And, and we find that Judas comes. He's one of the twelve. He brings this great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders. And he that betrayed him gave a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And he came to Jesus, he said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Jesus said, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Behold, one of them, which were as Jesus, stretched out his hands and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. And Jesus said, Put again your swords in their place, and uh, they that take the sword will perish with the sword. Thinkest not that if I could call to my father, he would presently give me more than 12,000 or 12 legions of angels, thousands and thousands of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? In that same hour, Jesus said to the multitude, Are you come out against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But Matthew reminds us that all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then the Bible says that all his disciples forsook him and fled. We've seen movies depicting the passion. We've seen movies uh, trying to uh, demonstrate for us what this scene might have looked like. But Scripture is very clear that Jesus is leaving the garden area and then he sees his disciples and Judas comes and has the group with him. Jesus doesn't seem alarmed. Seems more aggravated at his own followers than at Judas' followers. But John 18 tells the story from a different perspective, kind of filling in some of the gaps for us. When the chief priests and the Pharisees come with lanterns and torches and weapons, Picture, if you would, the Beauty and the Beast scene when they come after the beast, okay? The townspeople are all stirred up. But in John 18, verse 4, Jesus says it this way, 
Whom seek you? Why are you here? What, 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 what do you want? Who do you want? And they cried out and said, Jesus of Nazareth. Now notice in John 15, or I'm sorry, John 18, verse 5, we, we see Jesus responds and he says, I am he. And Judas, who had betrayed him, stood with him. But as soon as he spake unto them, as soon as he said, I am he, the Bible tells in verse 6, they went backwards and fell to the ground. The power of the spoken word of God by Jesus, the Son of God, in that moment was more than the audience could handle. Now there's two possible interpretations. Clearly, Jesus is identifying himself with God. You'll recall Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, that Moses is asking uh, the Lord through the burning bush, who's sending me? How do I answer when they ask who my God is? And he says, you tell him that I am has sent you. And, and the, the, the Greek translation here in, in John of, of that I am statement, uh, ego I me in the Greek, I am. You understand the Old Testament, Exodus 3, verse 14, that that is the, the proper name of God, those four consonants that we see in, in many of our commentaries and translations, the the, the YHWH or the JVW or the JVHV, JHVH, YWHW, those four consonants representing the holy name, the I am. And Jesus, throughout John's gospel, uses those I am expressions, doesn't he? I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. But here he simply says, I am. And the Bible tells us that they fell backwards. Now, now some people say, well, what that was, was they were reacting to Jesus' blasphemous words. Well, they wouldn't be blasphemous if he truly is the I am. Jesus says, I am, and, and they fall back. The, the Bible says they, they went backwards and fell to the ground. And, and, and now some say, well, they just stepped back and knelt. Or some say they were forced back, fell back. I, you know, I wasn't there. I can only tell you what the Bible describes. But I don't believe this is a, oh, we're so mad at you for blasphemy. We're going to back away from you so lightning strikes. I believe this is clearly a, a divine moment where the power of Jesus, I am. And the power of who he was was evident for that moment. Notice they ask again, Jesus, once again, who are you looking for? <laughs> I think it's a little sarcasm here. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm reading it just a little too uh, 20, 21st century here, but I, I see Jesus going, okay, who are you asking for? Well, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I have told you that I am he. You're seeking me, let these go that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke that of those thou givest to me, I have lost none. So Jesus obviously doesn't want a bloodbath taking place. He says, hey, hey, I'm here. I told you I see. Now let them go their way. And now we get more detail. It was Simon Peter who drew his sword and smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said, son, put away your sword, put it in its sheath. I have to drink the cup my father's given me. And then the band and the captains, the officers, the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Jesus has had the Gethsemane moment where he comes to complete surrender to his own plan for the redemption of Steve Davison and every other believer through the ages. There was no need for swords and staves. There was no battle to be fought. But even in what many scholars say, Jesus' weakness, you know, where he is exhausted and he's, he's prayed this whole time and he's, he's prayed great drops of blood, he would have been exhausted. He was in complete control. Hey, don't you understand? I've got to do the will of the Father. Look again at John 18, verse 11. Put away your sword. The cup which my Father has given me, I'll drink it. 
And then the band and the captains took him and bound him. Can I tell you something? They didn't have to bind him. He was willing to go. I think the arrest of Jesus teaches us several things. Number one, sometimes if we're not careful, we lose sight of his divinity during his passion. You see, so much is made of, of his humanity, and, and rightly so. He was 100% God, 100% man, the incarnation, the, the amazing reality of that moment. But in that moment, not just his humanity was in full agreement with the plan of God, but so was his deity. I think he looked at them and said, hey, I am. They were overwhelmed by the moment, and that would add to the charges of blasphemy. They knew what he was saying. Then a second time, Jesus says, who are you looking for? They probably answered it a bit more glibly, a bit more shyly. You know, hey, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I'm he. I do find it interesting that Matthew would call attention to the fact that Jesus said, wait a minute, I was with you every day, teaching and working with you in the temple. Why didn't you grab hold of me there? He knew the answer. They weren't going to risk an altercation in public. Jesus says, Peter, put away your sword. Peter, there's a cup that we have to drink from. My father's given it to me. Put your sword away. It's time for me to move forward. Now in the arrest of Jesus, we see, number one, again, Jesus was in complete control of the moment, perfectly surrendered to the plan. We see Jesus was completely God. He spoke with the authority of the great I am. And we see that he was the ultimate shepherd and fulfilled the promise of the prophet that at that point he would not lose one. Judas had betrayed him, but no one died that day. The Bible says Judas never really was Jesus's, but must have heard anyway. But of those disciples, that original band of brothers, historians tell us that only John died a natural death. We see, you don't lose when you give your all to Jesus. When I was a little boy, there was an evangelist at our church, and he asked the question, could you be arrested? Is there evidence of your Christian commitment? Jesus had done no wrong. His claim to be divine was true. And yet they took him, bound him. I wonder what would we be arrested for? And in the arrest of Jesus, I want you to see with me just quickly his deity, his humanity. I want you to understand his devotion. But I also want you to see it's an example for you and me. When our lives are completely surrendered to God's plan for us, we're not afraid of what happens next. Peace overcomes fear every time. Do you know the Prince of Peace? Do you have peace in the midst of a chaotic world around us? You sure can. Please go to our website, fbc-sellersburg.org and there we have a link to the gospel. It just says the gospel at the top of our page. A couple verses, a couple commentary notes on how you can clearly know Jesus and experience the Prince of Peace this Easter season. Father, I'm praying for each one that 
hears your word, that they would respond in obedience. May we find complete surrender like Jesus did. And may that give us the peace we need in these troubled days. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for life everlasting. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May God richly bless you, and I hope that you'll join us if you live in Metro Sellersburg this Easter season. Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock at First Baptist Church. We're located at 7912 Highway 311. We'd love for you to join us, especially Easter morning at 10 a.m. May God bless you.